the year is 2595. The world is very different to the world of today, but in some ways it is still very much the same. It is roughly October, autumn, although the seasons do not work the same way they used to. Three figures are making their way to a lone watchtower on the northern border of the Protectorate. The Protectorate is a corner of civilization in the lands of Borka. Borka once called something different a long time ago, although very few now remember that name. The wind is quiet at this point in time. All around you can see brown scrubland, a little bit of grass but not much. There are some dry riverbeds nearby this lone tower you see in the distance, a watchtower. A watchtower known only by its designation of 17N. Nearby the watchtower is a cliff rising up into the air. Such things are common in this part of the world. The great upheaval caused a lot of the local geography to violently react after all, so it's not strange to see flat lands and then sudden surfaces rising up into the air. There seems to be a building on top of that, but that's not your goal. For these three, they are heading to the Watchtower. Their mission is simple. Find out why this Watchtower currently is not responding to radio communication. It's been over a day, and this is a concern to those who run the Protectorate. The cults of the Judges, mainly, but several other cults have power in this region, all hailing from the capital city of Justinian, a symbol of order and civilization in this violent, rough land. So for now, three individuals are being sent to investigate. Whatever you find, you are to report immediately. You are to either use the radio to communicate what is going on. If everything is fine or needs a bit of fixing, you are to assist. And if everyone is dead, well, you are to retrieve their bodies and report back on why this has happened if you can. It should be simple though. After all, this is a watchtower in the middle of nowhere. What's the worst that could happen? The first individual leading the way. Who is it? The first individual then in the company is a uh, hugely freakishly big man, tall and heavily built, striding forward in his uh, leathery coat and hat, the typical sign of a city judge, at least a city judge, I should say, for that is only the second rank of judge. And uh, on his nose is uh, resting a pair of spectacles, striding forward with uh, long steps and an eagerness to them, a somber look on his face, his skin blistered and uh, broken up in places, like it's uh, dry and uh, pale and kind of weather-beaten, but still a relatively young man in his middle twenties, keen to prove himself and keen to be the first one on the spot. My name is Vorken, and I take great pride in having been sent out to do something like this. As a judge, your cult, in some ways, have built a lot of the Protectorate. They would say they are the founders of it, though some would disagree. One thing is certain, there are judges at this watchtower. And if they have fallen in the line of duty, it is your responsibility to bring them back 
to Justinian. No judge leaves another judge behind, if they can retrieve them, that is. Joining this judge on this mission is a young Spitalian by the name of Jürgen. He comes in just under six feet tall, a bit wiry in his build, but obviously having put effort into his physique, slender but muscled. Like Vorkin, leather is the order of the day so far as clothing goes, although his is meticulously well kept. No empty seals left, no tears in any of the clothing, all the joints gummed up to prevent anything from getting inside. He's no judge, though. You can tell by the sigil on his single pauldron that he is of the Spitalian order, those devoted to cleansing this land of the sepsis of the fungus that stalks it. Indeed. And yet, for now, your two cults have an uneasy alliance, so it is not unusual for you to be assisting in checking on one of the watchtowers. At the tail end of this company, there is a small, not very tall, not very large in figure or stature girl who is walking behind these two men. She looks young and it's very easy to tell what cult she belongs to because she's uh, definitely a a scrapper. She's wearing overalls that kind of hides how petite she is because they are pretty loose fitting on her body. She has her hair in braids and both her hands and her face is has not been washed for some time. But through all of this, through all of this dirt on her face and through the hair that kind of falls over her forehead, is a pair of piercing blue eyes and determination. She has a big smile on her face as she's constantly looking around, mumbling to herself when she sees pieces of scrap metal or pieces of old technology, picks it up on the way falls a little bit behind, but then catches up, throws it away, and then picks up a new piece. Or maybe she puts it in her pocket. Depends on the price. There certainly is a lot this far out. You even think, Matilda, that you may have seen a bit of a ruin just, just somewhere to the east. You could only wonder what treasures could lie within there, but unfortunately, that is not the goal today. No, your goal is the watchtower just ahead. You are very nearly there, all three of you. And it is deadly quiet. Granted, that's not that unusual. There is no wildlife out here. There never will be. It is dry scrubland for miles. But still, it's a little disquieting just how deadly quiet it is. What do you do as you begin approaching this watchtower to the north? As we uh, are getting nearer, and I can just eye the structure of the watchtower, I uh, take out the radio and I check the signal on it. The signal is dead. Totally dead, as in there is no transmission coming from this tower. Your own radio Oso will no longer have much of a signal back where you've come from. Proper long transmission signals on radios are quite a rarity these days, unless you have a proper radio tower. Yes. There might be one connected inside the actual tower that we could use. Um, and I put it back into my bag. And uh, I just gaze over it, the tower itself. Is there any sign of... Anything that we can tell from outside where we are now. Feel free to roll an instinct and perception roll. Build a dice pool of d6s based on your 
ratings in instinct and perception and roll. And I have a pretty high instinct of uh, four. It is uh, something that has helped me through several pinches in this life. Having been born an orphan, which is very common actually among the early judge recruits, they find people who are keen to serve and perhaps even avenge or take revenge for the life that they never had. I've often been more or less cannon fodder, set into battle or fights or conflicts. If I had just relied on my physical strength, I probably wouldn't have made it as far as I have today. And I have a 4, a 5, and a 6. So, with three successes and a 6, you have a pretty good success here. The first thing you notice is, again, there's no sign of anything. There should be a sign of something, because the station should be manned. Granted, not by too many people, you think these watchtowers are normally mounted by a machine gun, so normally they only require two people maximum, for machine guns can kill several foes very quickly, even today. But there is nothing. Except there is something. There's a flash of light. You blink a little, confused as to what it is. But you can see at the top of the watchtower, something is blinking on and off. On and off. It takes you a few seconds, but you, Vorken, would realize this is Morse code. Specifically, Morse code used by judges. It is telling you, danger, danger, get to tower quickly, danger, danger, get to tower quickly. What do you do? As soon as I realize this, having been kneeling on the ground and squinting over at the tower, I quickly stand up and I look over at my two companions. Scrapper, it's battalion, they are uh, calling for help. We must go. And I start striding towards the tower. Matilda has been squatting on the ground, looking at a couple of what looks like just a couple of courts entangled with each other, mumbling something to herself again. But she looks towards Walken immediately when he talks to her. How do you know? I uh, move and I point up towards the tower, loosening my judgment hammer from uh, where it's been clasped to my side. Up there, Morse code. They're signaling to us now. Oh, right, okay. Uh, yeah, she gets up on her feet and very quickly catches up with Morkin. I look down uh, at you as you stride next to me. Are you uh, hefting any kind of uh, weapon or anything to uh, defend yourself with? Yes, I do. I have a knife and I have a hunting rifle. The hunting rifle is strapped to my back. The knife is strapped to my um, thigh. I look up at you and smile with a big smile. This is going to be so exciting. This is my first real adventure. Like this, it's, yeah. Jürgen chimes in. If you don't temper your enthusiasm, it will be your last. Judge, are we certain that this is a distress signal? There's no chance it could be a trap set by someone who might have overtaken the tower. There is that chance, but it's a risk we'll have to take. If they need our help now, keep your eyes peeled. I see no other sign of struggle or conflict. And also, Vorkin, deep down, you know it's very rare for people to steal judge code. It's possible, but very rare. No, this isn't just any Morse code. This is specific judge code. I don't relay this. But I think it to myself, and I feel a sense of urgency, and uh, as I send uh, Matilda a last glance and I see her smile, you see my face also cracking up into a 
smile of excitement, something in my eyes like this, this might be just what I was hoping for. All three of you begin quickly heading towards the watchtower. And for the moment, everything seems peaceful. As you reach the watchtower, you get a good view of it. The watchtower itself is not too impressive. Simply a large iron building towering above you. You could imagine from the top of said watchtower, you'd get a pretty good view of the surrounding scrublands. The tower itself is surrounded by a metal wall. And you can just see as you approach, sort of dotted around the metal wall in a sort of perimeter, are five or six metal pylons. Those of you with a little bit of scientific knowledge, such as Matilda and Jurgen, would of course realize these are electrical pylons, currently powered down, which is good because if they were powered up, you would not be able to cross them. But currently, they are powered down, and as you pass them, you approach a large gate that leads through the wall to the main tower. You notice immediately that the gate is not closed, but slightly ajar. What do you do? Should we try to sneak in? The gate is open. I see that. I uh, do slow down my pace. I uh, move up slowly to the gate and I look down and I try to see if there is anything obvious that this would have been trapped somehow in any way. Looking for a wire or anything as I carefully reach out my hammer to see if I should see if it would be safe to push this gate open. You do not see anything. You take a quick look and generally it seems that if there was something here you'd think you'd see it, but no, you don't. If you poke your head in just a little past the gate, you will see that there is a small courtyard leading to the tower itself. It seems to be a small little shed next to the main tower, and then a small stable. And at the stable, eating some hay, you can see tied up a horse. You would be familiar with the sort of horse this is, Vorkin, which is a judge's horse, one which the judge here would likely be riding. The horse seems okay. Yes, it does. It might be good if you uh, keep a subtle approach, Scrapper, and just in case, stick to the sides, spread out a bit, and I nod over to Jürgen as well, and I look him over. Is he holding a weapon, or is he readying? How is he readying himself? Well, it's difficult to attract his gaze from behind the charcoal filter gas mask he's wearing, but you can see his hand clenching down at his hip. He has a large mace, and then on the opposite side, in a thigh holster, he does have a pistol. So he's his hand on the mace for now. Can I get any sense from the terrain has it been been churned up in a sense of a fight are there are there tracks coming in that aren't leaving out why don't you roll instinct and survival to get a bit of a grasp of the area can i make the same roll you can yes Uh, that is a two a three and a five so one success i get a four and a four and a six that is three successes jürgen you take a quick look around the area Scrubland, you can't really tell much from just looking at the place, but it doesn't seem as if there's anything too unusual, at least to your eye. Of course, the problem is there could be dangers lurking everywhere, especially that river bed. It's a bit of a crevice. It occurs to you that anything could be hiding in a crevice that you wouldn't be able to see from where you currently are. You can't really tell anything else. Matilda, you look around. Yes, this is a dangerous place. There could be anything hiding in those crevices. But you take a look at the building itself and immediately see that, yes, there are old bullet holes, old scratch marks. This place has seen conflict. You're not entirely sure it's seen recent conflict. The markings and the scratchings look too old. 
but you get a bit of a feeling as you sort of look just off to a bit of a hill. Did you just see something move? You think you did. You get an uneasy sensation on the back of your neck that for all you know, there could be several people out there watching you right now and you wouldn't even know because they could just be hidden behind a hill or hidden behind a crevice. It's quite difficult to see if you're not in the watchtower itself, it occurs to you. Can I use my uh, danger sense here? Yes, it gives you an extra dice normally, but in this scenario I'll also say that you suddenly feel watched. There's people watching you. You don't know where from though, but definitely you're being watched, but not from the watchtower, but from outside. And Silda turns around. There's someone watching us here. I saw something move. I act as if I didn't hear it, and I just uh, look to the side as if I'm being somewhat overly casual, and I ask, where? It's over the hill. I'm not gonna point, but behind the watchtower. Not from the watchtower, it's... Outside the perimeter? Yeah. Do I have a... Do I have a gut sense of the distance between us and that? You think to yourself, maybe 30 meters? If someone was to jump out, you'd see them. But again, you, you suddenly feel very out in the open. They could come from anywhere. They could come from the left. They could come from the right. If we close the gate, would that prevent them from reaching us? If you walked in to the perimeter and closed the gate behind you, well, then you'd, you'd argue if anyone was coming, they'd have to get through that gate. Huh. Get in. Let's close the gate. I'm right behind Forkin. The three of you enter, quickly, and as you do so, Vorkin, you find on the other end the metal bar that will, indeed, shut that gate tight. It's a sturdy gate. Most people would not be able to pass it, although you would know that explosives, of course, would do the trick, but otherwise it's a sturdy gate. Huh. Someone must have opened it from the inside and ventured out. I think to myself... And uh, I push it closed and uh, close their bar for now. The gate closes with a large metal clunk, and you are now in the perimeter. It's at this point that once again you, Vorken, notice something flashing from the top of the watchtower. Again, it's saying, quick, quick, up, quick. I stop just long enough to see this, and then I nod to you both. Let's hurry. And I start moving across to get to uh, whatever stairs or that might be leading up to the tower. There are no stairs, but there is a ladder going straight up to a hatch. Well, then uh, I shall go for that and to climb up. Vorken begins climbing the ladder, going upwards to the top of the watchtower. Matilda and Jürgen, you are now in this location. What do you do? You feel a little safer being surrounded by large metal walls. So inside the walls, there is only the watchtower. There are no other structures. There is that stable where a horse is currently looking at you, mildly bemused. And there also seems to be a little shed of some kind with a door currently closed. It would be foolish for more than one of us to be on the ladder at a time. That makes two easy targets instead of just one. So as Vorkin ascends to the, the judge's nest at the top of this watchtower, I'm going to go over to the shed and see if I can, again, looking for evidence of, of where the occupants might have gone or if there was a struggle. Certainly. You make your way to the shed. There is a door barring your path. What do you do? Is it locked if I jiggle the handle? You push it open, and it comes open. And nothing leaps out, right? No. In fact, as you look inside, it's a rather small space. Uh, well, what do I find inside? Is it uh, provisions, equipment? Is it a, like a radio station? Well, for starters, yes, there is indeed a large desk with radio equipment. You also notice a bit of an antenna just coming out slightly from the area, but not so much that it was obvious from outside. 
There also seem to be a bunch of crates, which may contain any number of things. Uh, without turning back, I'll just uh, speak. Not shouting, but loud enough to get her attention. Scrapper. Yeah? And just cock my head towards the crates. Missilla quickly runs over. Ooh, what's this? This looks exciting. I love crates. You never know what's inside of them. With the hope that she will then uh, begin to investigate that side of it, I'd like to take a closer look at the equipment. Does it appear operational? Was it used recently? Are like the antennas still warm? Anything like that? Please roll intellect and engineering as you attempt to look over the technology and see if it's working or not. Uh, that is a six and a five. Hmm, two successes. The power of raw intellect. You begin looking over the radio equipment, and yes, it's all working. Except one obvious thing. There is no power. You flick a switch, the on-off button, and it does not work. But apart from that, everything seems to be working. You also notice there seems to be some sort of generator just behind this equipment. You can see cables connecting it to something in the ground, you think? But that also, you quickly investigate, is unpowered. And this generator itself seems to not be a power generator, but rather something that requires power to then generate something else. Can I take a look at it and see if I can uh, figure out why there's no power? You can. Please roll intellect and engineering as well. Yes, Jürgen would never admit that he doesn't understand what's going on here because he lacks the engineering skill, so he'll pretend to be busy with the science, with the radio equipment until Matilda gets around to experimenting with it. I get two sixes and a four. Not only is that three successes, but two sixes means you get a very good success, more than normal. Matilda, you understand this stuff. This is good stuff, first of all. You could make a good bit of money if you just took this equipment with you, although you have a feeling the others might object. But still, this is good stuff. This is... you know what this is. It's a generator for the pylons. This would activate those, but it's got no power. You quickly observe that there seems to be a large power cable leading to this generator, and that goes into the ground. Huh. You think to yourself, somewhere nearby, there must be a generator. This sort of stuff isn't powered by itself. There will be a generator somewhere powering all of this. But currently it's not on, or there's been a disruption. You're not quite sure. All the equipment seems fine, but yes, no power for the moment. But you know what this is. This is not only the radio communications area, but also the place where the generators outside, the pylons, are powered. And these pylons are a kind of defensive emplacement, right? Yes. Matilda is gonna look over some of the things. He's gonna look back at her companion, see if uh, he's noticing her. And if he isn't, she's gonna snatch a few things. Could you roll agility dexterity as you attempt to snatch a few little power cables and batteries without being noticed? Uh, would this be opposed by my perception? Yes, it would. Please roll instinct and perception. Whoever gets the best wins. I get, I get two sixes. Uh, three fours and a five. Unfortunately, two sixes beat that just because of the quality level. So even though you are keeping an eye out, I don't think that... Jürgen would be expecting something right now, so you don't really notice Matilda just quietly pocket a few little bits of scrap. Nothing too big, she can't take the generator and the radio equipment, but she can take a few little spare parts. And yes, Matilda, you pocket into your little backpack a few little goodies for later on. Yeah. And, you know, Jürgen might notice that, uh her backpack is making other noises than when they came, but yeah, he didn't see anything. Vorken, you are climbing up the ladder. There's a hatch above you. As you begin climbing and making noise, suddenly the hatch opens, and you hear from above someone say, Eh, hey, uh, you, uh, 
<coughs> you are a friend or foe. I hope you're not a foe. <coughs> Identify yourself up there. I am Walken, city judge. Sent out to... to inspect what's wrong with Watchtower 17N. Ah! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Murdoch, city judge. Come up. I, uh... feel a bit of, uh, energy and, uh, jolt as I... am about to meet one of my comrades and I... make the rest of the way up, just sending a short glance down at my... backpack that I left below the ladder. And you head up. The first thing you notice is a very large machine gun emplacement currently pointed to the east. Again, the area also has enough space for a few people to observe and have a good view of the surrounding scrublands. Slumped next to the machine gun is a man. He is wearing similar clothing to yourself, Vorken. You can immediately tell he is one of your cult. He is wearing the hat carrying a hammer, but currently slumped with a gun by his side and looking rather feverish. He has a dirty brown beard and his leg is bandaged with a bloody bandage. You also notice, to your right, someone with a bow. They lower the bow though as you come up and they look at you with a friendly smile. They look a lot more healthy than the other man. They have some tattoos on their face, which you're not quite sure what they mean, and they have hair tied up in a sort of bun behind their head. They have a slightly darker complexion than the other man, whose complexion is more pale. What do you do? Look them both over as the other person there smiles and lowers their bow. I uh, lose in some of my tension. And then I uh, just go up and I look out the window at where the machine gun is pointed as I start to speak. Murdoch and... The other man comes forward. Harkal, it is a pleasure to meet you. I am glad you have come. Are there any others? He says, looking down from the watchtower, looking slightly hopeful. The other man, Murdoch, says, I hope there are some others. Uh, greetings, greetings, fellow judge. Please, please tell me you brought at least 20, 20 folks with you. Y you have, right? Y you have? There's been no emergency signal going out. All we have is quiet. Oh, fuck. Fuck, fuck, shit. And he kind of tries to stand up and then winces and falls down again as his leg seems to cause him some trouble. Hmm. What happened here? <laughs> oh, fuck, brother. I'm sorry, you're fucking dead. <laughs> we're, all, we're all fucking dead. Shit. The other man, Hakal, tries to come over and bring a handkerchief to the other man's forehead, dampening some of his sweat. Uh, you must forgive uh, Murdoch here. He is not well. He's been badly injured. Uh, it is unfortunate, though, there is only one of you. This is not good. It's not just me. I travel with a scrapper and a spitalian. But we have no legion with us, if that was what you were hoping for. It still will not be enough. We are surrounded, isn't that right, Murdoch? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fuck. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, buddy. We're, we're, we're fucking surrounded. You, you've walked straight into a, a trap. They probably... I tried to give you the signal, but... Ah, shit. I, uh... I gaze around the surroundings. And I just ask... Psychonauts? Psych- You f- <laughs> You crazy? We wouldn't be still alive! I don't know if that would be worse though. Fuck! Ah, my leg! Ugh. I feel a slight tinge of disappointment. Whenever s there's danger, I always somehow hope for this- these mythical beings of unimaginable powers to appear. <sighs> then what? And why haven't they taken the place already? <laughs> They're waiting. It's roaches. Fucking cockroaches. They ah, they, f they ambushed me and and then my boy, my boy. The this man Murdoch begins to tear up a little, and he clearly is trying to fight, crying. <laughs> they killed him, and, and they got me. They got my leg. Ah, I'm fine though. It's just just a flesh wound, but. 
there's a lot of them, and, and I think there's a lot more than we even thought. Like, five or six got us, but uh, they're, they're waiting, brother. You know how they are. They're waiting. It's only, only a couple more hours till dusk, and that's when they'll come. That's when they'll fucking come. When was this? I look at him, and I have a slightly pained look as I feel a bit of sympathy for him, especially if he's lost his child. You would know that for a man like this to be speaking of a child, he's probably speaking of a vagrant. All young novices are taken care of by an elder judge in their first years. It wasn't long since um, I self left my vagranthood, I think to myself. I was well looked after. Being able to go out like this for myself is a great pride. Murdoch begins coughing a little, and the other man, Akal, says, Calm yourself, friend, calm yourself. Yes, he speaks the truth. I happen to be here, well, on business of my own, but I heard the gunshots and came upon him injured outside. I've done my best to help him, but I'm not sure I can do much more. It's, medicine is not my path. Oh, there are others. The man called Akal kind of then goes over to the edge of the watchtower and calls down below. Please! C come up here so we can speak. It is safer up here. Jürgen and Matilda, you hear a man calling to you to join him up on the watchtower. What do you do? Uh, you, Jürgen, you could just go right ahead. I'll, I'll be with you in just a sec. I regard her with a bit of suspicion. Scrappers are not my favorite folk out in the wilds here, but I had a pretty good eye on her and didn't see her causing any trouble. So for now... I'm content to let my other duties take precedent over my suspicion of the scrappers. I'll nod and say, yes, anything that you can find your way to repairing or making operational would be helpful. I'll see if anyone needs my assistance. Yep, I, I'll... that's exactly what I'll do. Look for things to repair. He gives a, a curt nod, and then I will haul myself up into the watchtower. You join the others, Jürgen, as you again see these people before you. If you'd like, as you look at this man, the one with the tight bun, you can roll intellect and legends if you wish to try and discern his markings on his skin. Oh, that's two successes, a four and a five. Yes. One of the Gemharden. You are familiar with this cult. You haven't always seen eye to eye your cults. There's a little bit of a religious issue, but most of the time members of his cult are peaceful. After all, they believe in non-violence, for the most part. But yes, you recognize that his markings are those of that cult. It's strange to me that he would be in a judge watchtower, isn't it? You might think that, yes. I'll keep that suspicion to myself for the moment I will nod at Forkin and then over, looking over to uh, his fellow judge one of yours you're wounded sir ah oh, you were a spitalian oh okay yeah I ah uh, yeah no I'm fine it's, it's not an issue just just a little little scratch on the leg I, I it just hurts a bit but I'll, I'll be fine I'll be fine where's the scrapper I might just break in. Did you just say a scrapper? You got a scrapper with you? Where the fuck are they? Get them up here! If they're fucking stealing, this is protectorate property! The man, st Murdoch, starts trying to get himself up. Uh, this, sir, please, no, uh, today's scratch is tomorrow's sepsis. Uh, Vorkin, if you'd like to go supervise her work, I'm, I'm sure that would suffice. In the meantime, sir, please, I can tend to your wound. Murdoch has already made his way to the edge of the watchtower and begins yelling down. Hey, I, I can see you wherever you are. You, you take anything, I will have your head. Your fucking head, you little scrapper. Stealing fucking protectorate property, they all fucking thieves. Matilda is having the time of her life. This is not every day that she has access to this kind of stuff. She is very much enjoying herself. She is looking through all of this, a lot of it brand new stuff that she is taking apart, putting into her pockets, putting into her backpack. But at the same time, while she's doing that, she's also going to check out if there's anything else useful information that she can find while she's there. 
any other clues to where the electricity could come from or be generated from? There aren't any more clues other than somewhere not here. You quickly are able to discern that there's a central power cable leading straight to this location from somewhere else. Maybe west, you think to yourself. What you do notice, though, as you're pocketing a few more things, is that a lot of the barrels are filled with black powder. Barrels of it. Highly explosive. You can't take any of that with you, because it's in barrels and it's very explosive, but interesting nonetheless. Okay. I'm gonna take uh, just a little bit of it, put it in my pocket. You take a very small amount, careful to make sure you don't spill any of it. And yes, you have a little pouch. At this point, your pack is becoming quite heavy. I'm gonna head head up to the others. I'm I'm coming. So, yeah, I was just I was just looking for so, so, uh, uh, solutions and yeah, none of that here. Uh, I'm coming. Murdoch hurls a few more swear words down in your direction, Matilda. But eventually, he kind of looks to you as you come over, Jurgen, and let you look over his leg wound. Feel free to roll intellect and medicine. Uh, I will. Um, I also have uh, two items with me in my bag that might assist in this endeavor. I do have my field kit, which provides two bonus dice to an intelligence medicine roll. Yes. And like every Spitalian, I am carrying the manual, the collected learnings of, of battlefield medicine, of how to treat infestations, the collective basic knowledge of my order which also gives plus one dice. Uh, So that will be four for intellect plus medicine, and then three more dice from the equipment. Three successes and a six. You take a moment to sit this man down. You can already tell he's running a fever. He's highly delirious. That's not good. You take a look at the wound. It looks like a stab wound to his leg, but... There's more. Yes, there's an infection. Worse than that, a poison. You're not familiar with the poison, but you can see its mark on this man. You can help him a little, but you quickly realize he needs a proper Spitalian ward. He needs proper medication you do not have. If not, he will die at least in a day or two. This is a serious poison. Can I tell how recent this wound is? You think about a day. About a day. It started to set in a little. Yes, this must have occurred sometime yesterday, you think? Uh, So as I'm changing the bandage over, I'll make medical small talk with him. About uh, how long ago did you receive this wound? The progression is... And then I just kind of babble some medicine at him. Uh, what? Oh, it's fucking fine. It's just a fucking knife. I, uh, yesterday, when they ambushed us, uh, I wouldn't have... Yeah, the, the guy over there helped. He's alright, he's alright. He helped me get back in, I guess. I just... They just came out of the, the, the riverbed, and, and Angus, he didn't... He, he didn't see him coming, and then they just... They just slit his throat, and... and those fucking, fucking cockroaches, fucking... Sh- fucks! He was just... <laughs> He just been, sir. The man starts crying. Uh, conserve your strength, sir. If they return, as you say they will, you can channel that rage in that moment. But for now, it's best to give this some rest. It is as you say this that you notice Vorken from your vantage point. Three figures heading towards the tower. No, not heading. Running. They are running towards the tower. They are... humans. But they're wearing barely anything at all. Strange rags, brown furs, bones. They are pale-skinned. They have weird markings on their faces. Red markings. They seem to be wielding knives, cleavers. You're not sure, but they are heading to the tower rapidly, screaming at the top of their lungs. You're not sure where they came from, but they are here now. What do you do? Would there be any reason at all for me not to just man the machine gun and shoot at these individuals? There would be, because the second you go over to the machine gun, you realize that not only is it out of ammunition, it's also jammed. 
you see me trying to uh, latch the feeding mechanism. It's jammed. They're coming down. They're coming now. Metal is gonna pop up immediately. It's jammed? Yes, but there's also no ammunition. And I look down at uh, the other judge. Why is there no ammunition? <laughs> because we've run out! Why was there no dead corpses? No, why were there no corpses around? Why was there no sign of struggle? He gives you a bit of grin at this sort of sarcastic grin, says, It's fucking cockroaches. Again, now you can hear it screaming on the wind. They're screaming something. You, you don't know what they're screaming. It's very guttural. It doesn't really make any sense to you. Do you have any ammunition anywhere? Uh, y yeah, in, in my in my backpack over there for the big machine gun. The fucking of course I don't have any fucking ammunition. He suddenly shouts quite loudly. Okay, I'll 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 try to fix. I'll try to fix it. Um, it's little runs over to the machine gun, and I'm she's gonna try and fix it. For someone of your skill, you don't need to roll. It's quite quick. You just realize the problem and fix it. The machine gun is no longer jammed, but. Yes, there's also no bullets at all. Scrapper, when you were when you were in the shed, there was some kind of, of generator, something that might have powered the pylons outside. Did you see anything broken? Was there anything you noticed about how we might fix that? All I could see was that there's a power source going into the ground, but I don't know where. And also, uh, why is there explosives? In the shed. Why do you think there's fucking explosives just in case something like this? <coughs> Again, Murdoch tries to say something but begins coughing. You know why he's coughing. He is suffering a serious problem due to his wound. The other man comes over at this point and looks to you, Vorkin. Um, should we perhaps, friends, deal with the problem right now that they're coming? And he quickly unhurls his bow. Yes, I'm flinging the latch open to climb down to keep them out. Either if I have to hold the door or be ready wherever they might try and climb the walls. I agree. My pistol's not good at this range. If you and I can hold the gate, our scrapper friend here might be able to get the proper defenses up and running. And so, the three of you begin to scramble into position, doing your best to get down to that gate and stop these intruders entering the area. If they get in, things will certainly become very dangerous. You have listened to an episode of Red Moon Roleplaying, where we played the scenario Last Watch for the free-to-play primal punk RPG, The Genesis. The Genesis is published by Six More Vodka, who also sponsored this series. Head over to degenesis.com to download the game for free, and if you like physical books, you can head to their shop and use the code REDMOON10, R-E-D-M-O-O-N-1-0, with capital letters, to get 10% off your order. The code is valid until July 31st. We were joined by Aaron Hammonds from Queen's Court Games, as well as our dear friend Clara Herbel. The music was made by AlphaZone, Xerxes the Dark, and Sabled Sun, and was used with permission from their label, Cryochamber. Check them all out at cryochamber.bandcamp.com or their YouTube channel for more music for your gaming table. We would like to give massive thanks to our champions of the Red Moon. Martin Hoyshobert, Nastasha Rollerson, Simon Cooper, David, Julia, Camilla, Ludwig Manford, and Bob DeLang for their generous support. And we would of course also like to thank all of our other patrons. Without your support, the show would not be possible. If you want to support our work, please check us out on Patreon. You can get access to bonus campaigns for Cult of Any Lost and Coriolis there, as well as get early and raw access to all of our recordings. You can also hear your name read on the show as a champion of the Red Moon, as well as play cult with us. Most importantly, that support is what keeps the show going, so do check us out there. Thank you again for listening, and remember, Eschaton awaits us all. <laughs>